Welcome today on this beautiful day for our uh, Crease Noon Lecture Series. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention to uh, a lecture coming up besides the wonderful things that, are, that have been scrolling past you uh, for the last few minutes, but um, the Copernicus Lecture on Monday at 5.30 in the Stamps Auditorium, um, the theater of the eighth day will be presenting. So that's Stamps Auditorium on North Campus. Um, so we are delighted today to have with us uh, Dr. Sergei Ushakin, who is joining us uh, as part of our series on buying and selling states and markets. Uh, uh, Dr. Ushakin comes to us from Princeton University, where he is associate professor in anthropology as well as in Slavic languages and literatures. Um, he is also the director of the program of Russian, East European, and Eurasian studies at Princeton, so our uh, brother institution. Uh, Sister, <laughs> brother, mother, <Yeah>. father. <laughs> uh, astonishing array of publications from his book. Uh, I couldn't actually wheel over his CV because it's so long. <laughs> uh, including his book uh, from 2009, The Patriotism of Despair, based on his fieldwork in Bernal, Russia, um, to six, no less than six edited collections. And those are only the ones in English. Uh, his articles cover uh, an amazing array of topics from laughter, nostalgia, uh, aesthetics, uh, Sami's dot literature, um, and themes more related today's, to, the, to today's talk, uh, money, the economy, and consumption, especially um, in the time of the Soviet Union, but also uh, how that gets uh, transformed to understandings today. Um, so his lecture today is The Think System of Soviet Productivism, Building the Economy of Storage in Late USSR. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wyshakin. Thank you uh, for the introduction and thank you for. Uh, can, can, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you. Uh, yeah, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I I just want uh, to warn you. I'm not the best um, speaker in the world. Uh, when I start reading, I tend to to be too fast and um, incomprehensible. When it starts happening, just kind of signal somehow and I'll slow, slow it down. Um, this project is, um, uh, the, 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 my talk today, uh, is a part of a longer project that I started a few years um, ago. Um, it's partly it's um, based on uh, some archival materials that I got in, um, in, uh, in Barnaul, in Altai, sort of a big um, uh, set of documents uh, sent to the local party committees um, in, the, um, uh, in the end of the Soviet Union, complaining about consumption. But also, a lot of it comes from uh, the uh, texts on uh, journals, um, uh, trade journals, but also monographs on the so-called um, uh, political economy of socialism. Uh, that was sort of a huge field uh, throughout the Soviet period. Nobody reads it, but I think like, there is actually something interesting uh, to, to learn uh, in the way sort of these people uh, conceptualized um, the Soviet Union. So I want to start with two examples um, that um, help epitomize the nature of the problem I, um, I will be talking today. <clears throat> about, uh, I will be talking about today. So in 1956, uh, from 1956 till 1961, which is to say um, during the Khrushchev period, the Turk is that press, the publishing house of the Ministry of Trade, published a massive um, nine volume Targovoy Slavar, uh, Tavarny Slavar, commodity dictionary that covered more than 20,000 industrial and food items of mass consumption in more than 8,000 entries. Between Abajur, which is to say lampshade, um, uh, as its first entry, and Yashichnaya Tara, which is a storage box, as the last, this directory included pretty much everything that could be found in the Soviet universe. Through its lavish illustrations and elaborate entries, the diction dictionary was supposed to familiarize the quickly expanding body of sales workers, merchandise experts, and directors of stores, and I quoted from the, the, um, uh, the, the dictionary, with the Soviet system of things. This striving, um, let's see how it works. Um, yeah. This striving to create a scru scrupulous register of the material universe of Soviet consumption impressed the reader um, even now. For instance, an entry on galoshes um, listed and described 23 modifications. The entry on uh, graphene, carafe, uh, represented 17 different versions. The entry on halat, a robe, 
depicted an annotated 22 species, including, and I quote, an embellished evening robe, a robe for future mother, a mountain tajik robe, and a robe for nurses and laboratory assistants. The entry on guitar explained um, the history and construction of the instrument, while the article on gastronomicski tavari, delicatessen, uh, um, taught how to properly slice ham, sausage, or salmon. The entry on kolbasne izdelia, um, sausage items, uh, went on for 74 pages of a very small print, portraying uh, a paradise populated by the following sausage subgroups in the order of their appearance. And I quote, I just did very, very few of them. Boiled sausage, camel sausage, dietary sausage, poultry sausage, chicken, turkey, duck, and goose included. Deer sausage, horse sausage, smoked and boiled sausage, blood sausage, rabbit sausage, liver sausage, half smoked sausage, fish sausage, raw smoked sausage, and stuffed sausage. Equally precise were the descriptions of various tools and mechanisms, including the equipment for stores and warehouses. A Bible of Soviet materiality, the dictionary is an astonishing piece of evidence of a social, att social attempt to catalog as meticulously as possible real elements of the imaginary Soviet consumption. By the end of the Soviet Union, this fascination with the depiction of the Soviet world of things would fade away. The didactic fervor of Soviet nomenclaturists would subside too. New reference books on Soviet commodities would become more technical in their language um, and more pragmatic in their aspiration. Dry prose of good catalogs would be interspersed in these books with bleak schemes of various commodity clusters and detailed instructions on on instructions on how to recognize merchan merchandises in perfections and defects. The paradise was lost. Nonetheless, as before, uh, this trade literature would retain its main message. Soviet commodity was understood primarily as a sensuous thing, as a material substance, as a unit of use value, which needs a proper description and classification. So my second example highlights a larger context that made uh, this profound late Soviet investment in accumulating and organizing things, real or imaginary, possible. Alexander Levin and Anatoly Yarkin, two Soviet um, economists, wrote in their collective monograph titled Economics of Consumption, Theory, Management, and Perspectives, published in, uh, by the Academy of Sciences in, uh, 18, uh, in 1984, seven years before the collapse of the Soviet Union. I quote, in the developed social society, the rationalization of consumption becomes especially pertinent. A reasonable growth of mass consumption, a qualitative improvement of its structure, and the perfection of its form, all that is a necessary factor for developing social production as a whole, for increasing its efficiency. There are several interesting things about this quote, but for now I emphasize only one. Consumption is important, even crucial, not because it satisfies uh, people's desires, nor because it maximizes the profit. The rationalization of consumption is especially pertinent because it is a necessary factor for developing social production as a whole. This preoccupation with manufacturing and distributing Soviet goods uh, would firmly push aside the intricacies of the consumer's demands. It is not that individual or group needs, interests, or tastes were totally ignored. Rather, they were perceived exactly like that, like individual or group needs that could be satisfied privately in the individual or group manner. The organization of consumer desires through fragmenting the monolithic body of shoppers and creating diversified networks of niches was hardly an issue. Instead, as Soviet economists maintained, and I quote one of them, the phase of personal consumption is a starting point of the process of reproduction of the labor force. By consuming material and spiritual goods, the worker restores human forces and develops new skills, thereby preparing himself for returning to production. So taking this productivist view of Soviet consumption as my starting point, I want to explore late Soviet views on socialist commodity and commodity context. In particular, I'm interested in moving beyond the powerful paradigm of the culture of shortage and the economy of scarcity that have been, ha have been defining uh, the studies of socialist consumption for the last few decades. The point is not to neglect the chronic deficiency of major objects of consumption under socialism. Rather, my goal is to show that by displacing scarcity as the primary explanatory lens on Soviet consumption, we can clear up some analytical and ethnographic room for process, processes, practices, concepts, or paradigms that have been routinely overshadowed by the politically charged emphasis on shortages. In particular, I want to foreground the economy of storage by tracing the emergence of what Boris Sarvatov a Soviet theorist and sociologist of, uh, of culture called a thing system, <coughs> 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 uh, 
That is, that is to say, a historically specific constellation of tangible objects, institutional infrastructure, classification protocols, and ideological values which determine the parameters of the commodity context in late Soviet society. The change of perspective, I hope, can modify the interpretive matrix. For instance, what is perceived now as the ill-conceived overmanning burden of labor might reemerge as a historically available mode of uh, the working class production. What seems as the irrational overstocking of commodities could reappear as a crucial material precondition for stimulating <coughs> centripetal tendencies in uh, the otherwise fragmented country. To frame it differently, <coughs> to frame it differently, when taken seriously, <coughs> the productivist framework allows, allows us to see in the Soviet-style consumption not only material representation of the dictatorship of, over needs, with the perfect homogenization of society and the uniformization of needs, but also a historically situated attempt to take rationality and rationalization to its limits. <coughs> the shift in the focus uh, from storage shortage to storage that I propose is not just a reflection of the traditional anthropological inclination to insist that the human economy is embedded and enmeshed in institutions, economic and non-economic, as Polanyi would say. Rather, the late Soviet economy of storage, of storage demonstrates how the detailed assumption about the bound, boundlessness of human wants and needs, so typical for political economists, was displaced by a desire to take the notion of the intrinsically <laughs> limited amount of the necessaries, ne necessaries seriously. When seen from this perspective, the limited scope of the Soviet think system would look more like a communal attempt to set, um, set the ob <coughs> objective standards of the necessary rather than as a symptom of underdeveloped, restrained, or otherwise frustrated markets. To unpack this point, um, I will use the example of Soviet Stargovaya Baza, um, a warehouse, um, as a nodal point of the Soviet thing system. But before I do it, I, I want to make one historical detour. In the 1920s, Boris Arvatov, a leading theorist of Soviet prolet cult, which is proletarian culture movement, formulated the basic ideas that would define trials and tribulations of Soviet commodities uh, for the decades to come. Elaborating uh, an alternative to the market-dominated economy, Arvatov approached capitalist and socialist modes of production from the point of view of the commodity form. In his essay, um, Art and the Organization of the Everyday, published in 1926, he maintained that, I quote, the radical formal individualism, polystylistics, and subjectivist fortuity of daily objects produced for capitalist markets reflected two major aspects of capitalist production. First, this form of production uh, was designed for the market and therefore, um, I quote Arvatov, it was not linked directly with, with the organization of consumption or the needs of the consumer for that matter. Secondly, since surplus, surplus value was the main goal of this mode of production, the capitalist producer was more interested um, uh, with in profitability and exchange value uh, of the product rather than with the social importance of the commodity being produced. As a result, capitalist production must rely on marketing gimmicks and profit-driven ornamentalism, ukrashatilstvo, creating in the end things devoid of internal organicity, celestine uh, organicness. So socialism could overcome this aesthetic futility of capitalist production, aesthetic uh, nikchomnos, uh, as he called it, by restoring the organically implicit balance between the form and the thing. And it's um, form, uh, be, uh, sorry, between the form of the thing and its function, uncontaminated by a desire for profit. And I quote again, for a perfectly constructed thing, embellishment is nothing but corruption. So Arvatov's position is crucial here because it offers a different genealogy of the di dictatorship of needs. He's, he reverses the perspective. The goal was not to limit the individual, but to highlight the universal and the rational. So this attempts to read political economy aesthetically, taken together with the elimination of price and market as crucial mechanisms uh, responsible for violating the integral, integral organization of the thing, led to an interesting transformation in, in the perception of value of Soviet objects of consumption. In the situation of planned production and regulated prices and salaries, neither exchange value, that is to say the commodity's ability to generate different regimes of evaluation during its market circulation phase, nor even value, that is to say the aggregate expenditure of labor and material constitu uh, constituents, were of a particular importance uh, or interest uh, for those who determined the shape and structure of Soviet consumption. The Soviet commodity made itself known first and foremost as a material thing through its sensuous characteristics and consequently through its ability to meet or more commonly to fail uh, the requirements of quality and functionality. 
The productivist of, uh, emphasis on rationality of needs and importance of use value, which find uh, an interesting representation in late Soviet advertising, uh, where the um, a poetic enchantment uh, with means of industrial pro production would go hand in hand with dry, factual, and transparent uh, rendition of useful qualities of a commodity product. And so you could see sort of two examples. Sort of the first one is um, sort of an ad for uh, pam, pumps uh, being sold to uh, the Western consumers, and the other one is um, sort of um, advertising for macro. Um, so in 1976, an academic editor of the publishing press, Economica, went as far as to claim that it was indeed uh, use value, потребительная стоимость, that should be seen as a central category of the Soviet economy as a whole. So ideologically at its score, this productivist worldview did not simply banish exchange value from Soviet society, and this is one of my main points, to compensate for the obliterated sphere cir of commodity circulation, it stimulated the creation of what was supposed to be uh, a systematically regulated dynamism of things, to use Arbatov's definition. A massive commodity transmitting network, Tavara Pravodyashya Set, included multiple institutional associations, nomenclatures of things, protocols of interactions, and rules of behavior, which were supposed to administer the Soviet think system on rational grounds. Soviet productivism might not have replaced the government of persons with the administration of things, as Frederick Engels would have it, but it certainly made a long way ahead in this direction. So, the history of consumption in the late Soviet period, um, from 1961 until 1991, emerged in the economic literature of the time as a peculiar mix of ruptures and continuities. But despite various political, economic, and social changes, there was one stable trend that the Soviet economy demonstrated from 1940 on. It was not a shortage of things, though. Rather, it was a steady increase of the volume of commodities that did not enter the process of distribution, creating instead large inventories, tavarne zapasy, of perishable and lasting goods in retail and wholesale institutions. In 30 years, between 1940 and 1970, the inventory in industry and trade, trade grew by more than 1,000%. In 1985, the value of inventories accumulated only by state enterprises that were involved in material production amounted to 80% of national income. So the gradual emergence of this storage economy was not, was not caused by a single reason, yet predominantly the need for large reserves was justified in the 1960s, 1970s economically in the full accord with the productivist logic. Creating additional capacities for the stockpiling of already produced commodities was seen as a less harmful alternative to the difficulties with labor, resources, and production capacities that a decision to temporarily interrupt the large-scale production of basic commodities would have caused. Professional publications of the time provide a whole genre of horror stories that vividly depicted how a decision of a wholesale companies to reduce their stocks resulted in a profound commodity cr crisis. For instance, Evgeny Konevsky and Yakov Arlov in their book The Economist Fights with Pencil, Quality, Assortment, and Trade defended the idea of the um, rationality, uh, rationally organized trade, and rationally organized trade in this case meant uh, rhythmic and systematic, by citing the shaving, shaving razor crisis of 1959. Overwhelmed with the excessive inventory of razors, the wholesale trade um, lobbied the government to reduce the overall production of razors um, from one, um, 1,200 million pieces in 1959 to 800 million, right? So um, basically by a third. By a third. The decision did increase the in, uh, de decrease the inventories, but it also caused a huge spike in demand. To avoid unpredictability in the future, customers were stocking up uh, with razors. In 1962, Moskovsky Leninsky department store, a major store in Moscow, uh, sold 4.2 uh, million razors, and usually it would sell only about 1 million razors uh, per year. So it took three years to restore the original volume of razors production and about five years to stabilize the trade. S similar crisis happened with toothbrushes, irons, buttons, sewing needles, and so on. Such stories did make wholesale and retail institutions more conservative um, with their inventories and contributed to the overall increase of reserves. But from the early 1960s, a new explanation started taking shape. Without disputing the goal of the efficient and rhythmic commodity motion, Tavara Divizhenia, more and more economists pointed out that the process of excessive amassing of goods was not exactly voluntary nor could it be entirely reduced to the flaws of distribution. Instead, as multiple articles suggested, the unhealthy attachment to commodities um, that the trade institution demonstrated, this distinctively socialist form of commodity fetishism, had to do with the fact that these commodities were not um, wanted by the consumer. 
For instance, Viktor uh, Kranyanka, an economist, indicated in his study of prices and consumer demands that excessive growth, growth of inventory in 1962 in Soviet retail trade, 54% in one year, was largely achieved by the accumulation of unwanted shoes and textile. Um, a micro-study of the retail shoe market in Leningrad, published by a group of sociologists in 1974, adds more detail to the, detail to the picture. As the study pointed out, the Soviet shoe industry produced enough shoes to meet the rational norm, and the rational norm at this time was estimated as 3.3 pairs per person, and the industry was producing three pairs, per, per, uh, per, uh, three pairs of shoes per capita. Um, moreover, the scholars also noted uh, that in terms of their sturdiness, sanitary, and hygienic qualities, Soviet shoes were certainly superior to the imported ones. However, Soviet shoes lagged behind from the point of view of design, color scheme, and fashion. Interviews with consumers confirmed the overall argument that the most unsatisfied consumers uh, were the ones who already had the highest number of shoes. <laughs> women, women between 19 and 39 uh, year old had on average 8.3 pairs of shoes, but would like to have at least 10.1. Women of over 40 years uh, owned on average 7.5 pairs, but would settle on eight. So these and other studies help to document a somewhat obvious argument. The productivist approach to consumption might be uh, able to saturate stores with functional things, but it could hardly succeed in turning these things into successful commodities. Consumers' criticism had less to do with uh, their inability to satisfy their basic needs and more with their frustrated desires. The excessive inventory of rejected goods was not the only instance of um, worrisome hoarding. The massive stockpiling of goods was predictably accompanied by a sizable um, hoarding of money. During 1961-1964, the volume of individual savings, uh, saving accounts increased by 44%. In 1965-1968, the increase was already 104%. Uh, Against the growing size of unwanted commodity uh, mass, which required more and more um, um, additional time, space, time, and labor for storing, the withdrawal of money from the field of consumption looked especially disturbing. In a sense, these incapacitated assets could be seen as a perfect symbol for the period that would be characterized later as stagnation. Immense financial and material resources were frozen in time and space. Um, their circulation was arrested, intentionally or inadvertently. Potentiality were turned, uh, potentialities were turned into a burden. The process of unwanted accumulation of stuff combined with the enforced hoarding of money consider considerably modified the official uh, attitude to Soviet consumption in the 1960s. Consumption emerged as a theoretical and practical problem that could um, no longer be ignored. <clears throat> to amend the situation, the trade experts proposed a predictable solution. Since needs are rationally limited, the number of products that could satisfy these needs by definition had um, a finite nature. The easiest way to deal with the problem was to supply the industry with an exhaustive nomenclature of desirable goods. Overstocking, in other words, was associated with the imprecise cartography of consumption rather than with the fluid nature of desires. In their article, trade experts would spend a lot of time discussing flaws of statistics and imperfection of consumer products nomenclatures. The original assumption that the rationality of the consumer, the, about the rationality of the consumer, was rarely questioned. What was questioned instead was the insufficient level of rationality in the organizing the Soviet thing system. A 1970 study on demands and preferences for toys, for instance, emphasized that the retailers used a classification of toys that included 7,000 uh, inventory positions, sort of different kind of qualities um, of uh, toys and groups of toys. At the same time, the official statistic form for retail sales <coughs> listed toys under a single uh, cumulative entry and therefore provided the producers with no feedback uh, for expanding or changing the structure of their output. In 1975, Dmitriev, an economist from Leningrad, similarly complained that the assortment of retail stores included more than 350,000 kinds of commodities, yet there was no truly scientific and unified classification of these goods, and cons consequently, no systematic basis for figuring out what the optimal assortment should look like. So they were all looking sort of for the matrix that would organize the um, sort of uh, material world. So the growing social prominence of Soviet trade was accompanied by an interesting theoretical shift in understanding the actual contribution of trade from the point of view of Soviet Marxism. University textbooks on Soviet trade traditionally classify this uh, area of economy as a sphere of circulation, sphere of Russia. Unlike industry or agri agriculture, trade was seen as non-producing. 
which is to say as a field that doesn't create a new value. Instead, its chief function was to change the already existing form of value, a material one, um, into a monetary one. Money. So this transformation, transform, trans, transformative function of social trade, though, had a very clear limit. Predictably, every textbook and monograph on Soviet trade emphasized that socialist exchange of commodities uh, for money had a distinctively different socialist nature. Under capitalism, as the argument went, trade in general and hoarding of commodities in particular were motivated um, by the goal of maximizing profit. Moreover, capitalist uh, wholesale, wholesale trade was usually organized as a chain of resales, as a virtual turnover of commodities at stock exchanges, fictively tavarabarot. The consumer's actual needs played um, in these resales and hoarding a very small role. Hence, the circulation of commodities under capitalism was perceived as being wrought with fundamental contradiction. Trade did not just mediate the exchange, it also interfered uh, with it. The late Soviet alternative to the pitfalls of capitalism trade was a dual nature. The first crucial intervention was aimed at changing the existing socioeconomic taxonomy. It always starts with language. Trade was increasingly recognized as a productive sphere, but not necessarily a producing one. Um, and um, as a productive branch of economy, socialist trade was supposed to produce not profit, but tavara abarot, uh, commodity turnover, which is to say an, uh, the average volume of commodities to be transmitted through the wholesale and retail network to the consumer. Again, like, sorry, there is no general equivalent like, in, in, in the um, understanding. So the social significance of trade was more relevant than its uh, financial uh, viability. And the two key wholesale and retail trade institutions in the USSR, uh, Ross Massa Riba Torg, uh, so the, the, the company that, um, that provided uh, the supplies uh, to the grocery stores, and the other one, um, uh, Ross Bacalier, that provided um, dry goods, made up their losses. They were completely unprofitable, and they made up their losses by making ice cream and packaging sold, respectively. So instead of maximizing its own profit, the trade was expected to relieve the industry, industry from the burden of produced commodities um, and to recuperate, if possible, the original expenditures. So socialist trade did not mediate incompatible interests through pricing. Instead, it harmonized the common ones. It restored uh, the original unity of the thing and the need promised by Arvatov. Social hoarding, then, was supposed to be an example of a process of quasi-commercial fine-tuning. By accumulating in one location commodities produced by dispersed state companies, trade organizations uh, pursued and uh, did not pursue uh, their own profit. They were enlarging the choice of potential consumers. They did not interfere with. They integrated and streamlined the connection between the uh, producer and the consumer. The perception of trade as a provider of direct access rather than as a convoluted may, uh, may, maze of capitalist markets was reflected especially vividly in store designs that were promoted um, in the media at the time. In 1969, Sovetska Targovlia proudly profiled Leningrad, a new grocery store uh, in Moscow, um, emphasizing the fact that it had 120 meter long wall of window cases unobstructed by machinery columns and stair or staircases, and they emphasized it in, um, in the article. Stores of small scale, of small scale, used a similar aesthetic of uh, display, exaggerating the arcade-like visual perspectives and the general feeling of openness. It is precisely at the intersection of these economic, social, and discursive trends that we can trace the emergence of an important social and cultural institution that so far has been um, on the periphery of any sociocultural analysis of Soviet consumption. I have in mind, of course, a Soviet склад, base, распределительный центр, which is a warehouse, a stockroom, a distribution center, whose main purpose was to accumulate and allocate uh, goods to amass commodities in order to make the life of the late Soviet consumer better. Effectively emerging as a middleman between the producer and the retailer, the bazaar assumed a peculiar function in the late Soviet storage economy. It justified the productivist obsession of industry, which was not interested in knowing the details of consumers' uh, preferences. At the same time, it limited commercial activities of the retail system by blocking direct access to producers. The epitome of the uh, rationalized understanding of consumption, again equated with the proper commodity mo motion, the bazaar became a major obstacle for any flow of resources and goods that did not meet the requirement of, uh, requirements of the dominant version of rationality. There are two areas, however, where the bazaar did succeed. In the work on storage economies by historians and anthropologists, illuminates an important aspect of the Soviet variant of this economy, economic formation. In his research on Mesopotamian economic history, Leo Oppenheim 
traced the emergence of a specific economic model that persistently lacked a developed marketplace and relied instead on the combination of a self-sustained village economies and large storage centers associated with sanctuaries and or palaces. The wealth produced by peasants and accumulated uh, in the centers was used, for con was used for converting into other products. Yet predominantly, these storage centers performed two main functions. Through accumulation of goods, they integrated the scattered communities of village producers and um, um, used uh, the price control for staples, the enforced standards of measurement, and limited interest rates for the bureaucratic management of things and people. Consequently, through redistribution of wealth, the centers produced and maintained a complex social hierarchy, including the support of secondary hierarchy of personnel, from priests and scribes to warriors and merchants. A feudal society of sorts, this economic formation turned the administration of things not only into a tool for building short-lived empires, but also into an effective instrument of forced urbanization and road construction for tax and military purpose. Branislav Malinovsky, in his study of the tribarians' um, passion for accumulating food in order, I quote, to, to keep it exhibited in the yam houses till it rots and then can be re replaced by a new crop, also famously suggested that this process of overstocking, irrational from um, an economic point of view, should be uh, read culturally as a manifestation of the fundamental human impulse to display, to share, and to bestow. The product of intense labor, yams accumulated in one location and destined for decay, provided a material foundation, a base, indeed, for social interaction and rituals of reciprocity. Similar to the examples cited by Oppen uh, Oppenheim, the excessive accumulation by the Trabrians was a form of economic activity employed for non-economic purposes. Namely, the uh, maintenance of social cohesiveness was privileged at the expense of wasted yams. Finally, Anyat Wiener um, adds another important argument to this discussion. In his study, study uh, um, of inalienable possessions, that is to say the important objects purposefully withheld from circulation exchange, um, these possessions are the hub, as she describes, uh, around which social identities are displayed, fabricated, exaggerated, modified, or diminished. Captured and retained valuables uh, uh, perform an important operation of social authentication by ranking individuals and groups on the basis of their inalienable possessions. In other words, keeping things to oneself worked as a basic precondition for creating or defeating social and individual hierarchies. The late Soviet Kanzam storage economy offers an important addition to this discussion. The built-in passion for accumulating things was realized here on an unprecedented massive scale. It generated forms of social and geographic connectedness, it established social hierarchies, and it framed rituals of interaction. The Baza, a Soviet version of the Trabrian um, Yam houses, was the center of this process, and as I argue, its importance should be understood precisely from, point of, from the point of view of integrative effects in hierarchical structuring that these allocative uh, centers constantly generated. Mikhail Zvanetsky, um, a Russian writer famous for his short satirical monologues, um, has a well-known sketch called In the Warehouse, in the Skladium. The opening line of the sketch uh, lays out the dominant view of the late Soviet period. As Zvanetsky puts it, I quote, the biggest dream of our people is to end up in a warehouse, inside a stockroom, right in the middle of it. Partly, Zvanetsky's sketch was a reflection of changing condition in the late um, Soviet Union. Until 1953, wholesale trade was mainly controlled by um, uh, in industrial ministries. Glav Tabak, which is uh, the main um, uh, tobacco um, company, had its own wholesale centers, as did um, Glav Vodka, and so on. In 1953, the wholesale trade became a prerogative of the Ministry of Trade, so they were consolidating everything. Uh, but the wholesale, wholesale centers, Opta Baza, is the key element of commodity distribution in the country. And within 30 years, from 1960 to 1930, the um, uh, overall store, storing capacity grew uh, more than three times. Um, uh, this institutional growth brought with it an escalation of the base personnel from 77,000 in 1960 to almost 200,000 in 1980. In addition to these changes, in, 19, in 1966, the government increased the limits of inventories, a passe, that wholesale bases uh, were allowed to keep. For instance, in the 1980s, Soviet bases cumulatively had reserved enough food supply to keep them going for 36 days without any new shipment. In 1940, uh, the same indicator was 20. With sugar enough for 170 days of sales, 
with meat for nine days and canned fish for 85. Throughout the 1970s, uh, though, uh, the buzzers routinely exceeded even these increased norms by uh, 10 to 30 percent, depending on the type of commodity. So, um, an article um, in Soviet Targovlia um, gives some idea about the dimension of this real expansion, so like really humongous uh, structures that they were built. In 1966-1974, a major warehouse facility was constructed in Krasnodar, a big city in southern Russia with a storing capacity of 32,000 um, square meters, which would be about like 344,000 uh, square feet. The warehouse had three kilometers of its own railroad uh, that linked all buildings, and it could simultaneously load and unload 30 rail, um, railroad cargo carts. In addition, this new uh, warehouse consolidated smaller storage houses previously dispersed throughout the city, bringing under one roof major uh, regional wholesale companies. So, Zhvanetsky might not have been aware of the growing significance of this buzz, yet his sketch nicely demonstrates how this institution uh, became an important part of people's imagination. Apart from its material content and social prominence, the cultural significance of the warehouse had something to do with the symbolic association that this word invites. In Russian, sklad derives from the same root as klad, a hidden treasure. Every warehouse is also a promise of a miracle, of a short-term material paradise, with unexpected rewards and unpredictable findings. So Zhvanetsky's sketch, sketch uh, describes exactly this, situa th this mutation of sklad into clad, the transformation of a warehouse in a treasure island. Written in the early 1970s, the sketch is a, constructed as a dialogue between a clerk, kladovshik, which literally means a treasure man, who works in a warehouse filled with consumer goods and an outsider, a typical Soviet white-collar worker who was given a unique chance to buy commodities directly from the warehouses, and the warehouses were prohibited from um, um, doing any retail. So, and this privilege uh, usually was reserved only for the so-called spetskontingent, the special contingents of population. Arriving at the warehouse, the worker doesn't know what to expect, skeptically announcing to the clerk, I quote, um, I was told that you would have everything. I do not believe this, of course. The skepticism is totally thrown off by the question of the, of the clerk. So what do you want? Conf confronted with, the, with unlimited yet unspecified possibilities, the consumer is totally perplexed, having a, re a really difficult time articulating his request and wishes. What do I want? Well, what do I want? I want, well, well, oh my God, what do I want? But what do you have? Uh, this momentous aphasia is followed by an extensive exchange between the two persons. The consumer's initial desire are shaped as desires, uh, desires for generic categories. Can I have some medicine? Do you have something in terms of clothing? Do you have something, well, to eat? For instance, say, some sausage. As the sketch unfolds, it becomes more and more obvious that this utilitarianism, uh, this monopoly of functionality, is only a default position, which does not, however, preclude uh, the individual from knowing a highly diversified nomenclature of imaginary consumption choices. So all those kind of dictionaries were published not for nothing. So to quote a part of this dialogue from Zhvanetsky's sketch, the customer, so what about fish, the clerk, how much? No, what about a fresh one, live one, you mean? Yes, couldn't you have live fish? Which one? A lively life one. <laughs> Which one are you interested in? Who, and me? Well, uh, I'm interested in um, carp, how many? Catfish, then, how many? Then sturgeon, uh, how many? Trout, yes, do you have it? How many? Three, okay, three. Four, okay, four. Uh, four and one sturgeon. So five pieces altogether. Um, yes, and a catfish, too. It will go bad, then one. Uh, I write down two, but they will go bad. Uh, write down three and let them go bad. And add some roach, boba, as well. The story ends somewhat sadly. After the customer uh, accumulated amount of stuff, uh, he's asked where all these things should be delivered to. He goes through all the possibilities, dismissing each of them. Finally, he requests to deliver things to a railway station uh, so that he could take them to the north. Uh, the clerk is puzzled by this decision, given that the customer is from the same city. Why the north? He asks. Because I won't be able to live here anymore. They won't let me. You can live a miserable life pretty well here, but a good one, they won't let you. So, exaggerated satirical, this sketch is helpful in outline, outlining the late Soviet view of material consumption. The impossibility, the impossibility of a good life, the negative perception of material abundance, the lack of any visible concern with prices or money, 
I combine here with a highly ramified language of imaginary consumption choices and a truncated experience of actual consumption. Paradoxically, the baza, the outpost of the state in the world of consumer products, was envisioned as a place where all pretenses about the reasonable consumption could be suspended. The fish might trot, but the very ability to have the excess of it justifies the waste. The sketch also exposes an interesting perception of social differentiation, the very process of individual accumulation. Even the funnest is seen as being socially explosive. This administration of things through lists and categories provided a model for administering people. The proverbial Soviet sausage was turned into the ultimate measuring stick that indicated the amount of allocated meat as well as the social status of those who got a hold of it, special. Norms and list of products available to various spets contingents uh, demonstrate a particular technology of gover governmentality that equated individual and collective accomplishments with quantities of various use values. And it's hardly surprising that in Soviet bureaucraties, nomenclatura, understood as a list of positions and people confirmed by higher authorities, became a self-appropriate -appro name for the state and party elites. As we know, the Soviet nomenclaturists, with, uh, uh, Soviet nomenclaturists' will to rationalize would remain futile uh, uh, throughout the late Soviet period. In 1984, after more than a decade of intensive debates, Alexander Levin and Toli Yarkin, whom I quoted in the very beginning, tried to sum up the essence of rational consumption under socialism, yet all they could do was admit the undeniable. Today, we still have no complete clarity when it comes to questions about the concrete content of the problem of rationalization of consumption, or about its socioeconomic essence. Nor can we say definitely what rational consumption and rational demands consist of. Moreover, the very issue of demands create a lot of disagreement among economists. As experience shows, consumers themselves do not have the slightest idea about what rational consumption means from the scientific point of view. So I've been arguing that it was precisely this underlying rationalist belief in the commonality of use values of, so com of Soviet commodities that framed scientific approach to organizing the world of late Soviet consumption. The alter alternatives proposed by Soviet productivists, commodities that were not supposed to enter circuit of exchange more than once, trade that was exempt, uh, exempted from uh, producing profit, warehouses that had almost no control over their inventories were hardly successful economically. The utopian nature of this rationalistic project is, of course, obvious. The late Soviet society could not reach any agreement on what the rational needs should be, let alone on the ways that they could be satisfied. Instead of solving contradictions, these alternatives clogged the economy <coughs> with mounts of useless stuff. Yet the importance of this utopian project is not in its failure. Rather, it is interesting as a historical specific attempt to envision and build a community in which dynamic things could speak for themselves, unencumbered by the corrupting influence of money, market, or exchange. Thank you. Was, was it too fast? Sure. <laughs> it was. Sorry. Um, please. I feel like I should sing yes. with this. Uh, hi, Sergei. Um, so it's a wonderful talk, and I have a question actually about something on the periphery of the talk. Uh -huh. uh, it's not the thing system. It's mm -hmm. the I'm I'm curious about the materiality of the catalogs or compendia of production material that may or may not have actually been put into production, but uh, whether or not those you know how widely those catalogs or the um, or the or the not individual print advertisements but actual compendia mm -hmm. how widely available those were and to the extent to which they uh, were themselves treated as consumables mm -hmm. in much the same way as any one of us might spend a uh, half hour glancing through a crate and barrel catalog with mm -hmm. no intention of buying anything. It's actually the fantasy of the catalog that is the consumable itself. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about the uses of these catalogs. How are they distributed? Um, how are they used other than to actually go obtain the thing? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, 
It's a great question, and the short answer is they weren't. Um, for instance, I learned about this catalog only when I arrived here, so I was just kind of you know, poking in the library at Princeton sort of, that has like sort of pros and rows on this economic literature, and that's how I discovered it. Um, uh, I don't remember the circulation, but it wasn't widely available. This one, um, uh, that version was Spravochnik um, Tavaraveda, uh, but like, how many people would want kind of to flip through it? Like, sort of, what kind of sort of visual pleasure would you, you would get? None. Uh, so what what started coming up now? Actually, sort of, you could see it um, uh, on on the internet uh, uh, once in a while. Uh, there were catalogs for places like Berezka, which is a hard currency, uh, hard currency um, stores, that were sort of visually pleasing. So you do get this kind of commodity porn of sorts that you're talking about. Uh, but again, they were sort of, they had very very limited circulation, and they were in um, in English. But I know um, again, like from um, some um, kind of um, anecdotal exchanges uh, that um, people started bringing in the, in the 80s mostly catalogs from uh, mostly from Germany. So I remember those kind of being circulated precisely for kind of this sort of imaginary consumption that you're asking about. But with this one, um, that that kind of really this one, I, I'm still surprised that nobody writes about it because it's it it, it really has everything. Uh, I, I, I shouldn't overemphasize the um, kind of the quality of it. Sort of those um, 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 colored pictures, they were inserts, right? So, but by and large, it it wasn't. It was sort of like that, uh, mostly, like um, this one, sort of kind of grayish, uh, very very thin paper. Sort of like not really kind of interesting. But the uh, the um, inserts are spectacular, actually. They are. Mm -hmm. Elena, just wait a sec. <laughs> Well, uh, I have this question. At approximately the same time, in 1961, when the uh, third program of the Communist Party was mm -hmm. uh, published, and that was the program for the building of communism, Programma Последнего Коммунизма. And if you read it carefully, actually, uh, the first part of it is uh, a way of, they try to define what communism is. And one of the key phrases is, all the wealth will gush abundantly. Mm -hmm. And then they explain, there are passages where explain that um, Soviet people will have better consumption than people in the cap capitalist countries. They will have woolen cloth, that much of woolen cloth. They will have that many, well, actually they enumerate things in this very um, program for the building of communism. And uh, so, can we see, uh, well, this kind of economy as a way to, well, to actually realize this dream of communism by providing what is promised in the program, meaning that, look, uh, communism is, well, about many things, but firstly, it is about consumption and this consumption has been somehow defined, and now we are fulfilling this, uh, this uh, aim, this goal of uh, providing for this kind of consumption. It is interesting that, uh, well, probably a bit later, in 1967, 1968, this uh, novel by Kozhinov, Kochetov was published. What do you want? What do you want? So, do you see any connection here? At all? I mean, generally, yes, but uh, pragmatically, I, I, I don't. Um, and uh, one of the reasons is we have, well, like, I think it's 1961 when um, uh, 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 were um, abolished, and uh, so in, in colleges, uh, people didn't get any salary, so they would get um, uh, uh, their uh, output, their work would be measured in uh, uh, labor days, right? So we had that, and I think it's still it's in early uh, 60s, uh, Mikhayan, uh, sorry, there was a major discussion, sir, should we actually force the development of uh, monetary relations, and should we develop trade as an independent institution, or should we, should we be thinking about actually sort of direct supplies, right? So they really have, and Mikhayan was in charge of that, so I skipped this whole kind of thing about Mikhayan, but Mikhayan is a very interesting figure in this case. Um, uh, so you do still you you, st you do have people who don't really know at this moment so how we should be developing it, 
right? Should we really keep trying creating this sort of nomenclature of things? So should we really invest time and money in understanding or effort in understanding what these people actually need and then supply them with this, with this right? Or should we kind of let it grow in some kind of different sort of more organic sort of way, or namely capitalist, right? And there is a clear sort of hesitancy about kind of taking money seriously, and it would be it would be this way for a long time. But um, but idealistically, yeah, no, I mean. The, it's funny, actually, I, I didn't put this together, but this Tavarna um, Slavaj was published, finished uh, the, the project, which was for several years, in 1961. That's when the the, the, uh, the new program on the Communist Party comes out, namely sort of now they have the, the, the vision of the paradise, so to speak. They know like what to promise to people. So um, kind of generally, yes, but pragmatically, I just don't think so. Um, and, and for me, what is more interesting is precisely sort of in, in the 60s, they had this... Uh, real kind of boom of developing the tr trade as a, sort of as an institution of the Soviet Union, but again, without a clear understanding how it should be operating, how it should sort of, ma should it maintain itself, namely, should it be kind of self-sustainable, or is it a social institution as Professor Yuse would do? So, you know, I don't know if I answered. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Um, so th I'm, I'm interested in the mechanism, mm -hmm. why this would have happened. And it sounded to me as if you were saying that that uh, it was about the development of taste, mm -hmm. about people, you know, if there are no shoes, if people are walking barefoot, uh, then you make a shoe, they'll buy it. Mm -hmm. If they have six shoes already, then they're going to hesitate right. Right. until they can get that yeah. shoe from, I don't know, Bulgaria or right. France right. or whatever. And we, I remember these times. Yeah. You remember these times as well. So that's, that's one problem. The, the other thing is consumption is, a, is not a static process. Mm -hmm. and, and once this, this Tavarni Slavad is, is made, it's finished. It's over. It's no use anymore because the next day they're already developing new mm -hmm. things or people want new things. Was there any discussion about the, this dynamic, that is, that things are changing and mm -hmm. we need a mechanism in yeah. order for that to change. Yeah, there was, and it started like in the mid um, uh, 60s, um, uh, precisely because of this hoarding when um, the, the government realized that people have tons of money, but they're not buying like the tons of things that we actually produce for them, right? And so what is happening is, I, I think it's 68, um, I, I have the dates, uh, uh, there, there is a major meeting of Rabotniki, um, uh, um, 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 sort of salespeople in, in the Kremlin. I think it's about uh, 1,000 people who got there, and uh, for several days they have a very sort of extensive discussion on like, sort of what to do. And the, the slogan that they come up with is uh, which is to say a good commodity would always find its own ruble, right? So, and as a result of that, what happened, and I totally didn't know about that, like nothing, and I, I'm surprised. I've sort of, I, pay, I mean, I try to pay attention, but sort of this completely escaped me. So after that meeting um, um, uh, in the Soviet Union, they established a system uh, of um, a monitoring service, right, throughout the whole country and very ramified. So, and then they were tracing sort of the sellability of, I think, um, several groups of uh, commodities, right? And as, as a result, in, in St. Peter and Leningrad at the time, uh, there was Institut Sovietske Targovli, where they kept producing all kinds of sort of um, 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 research volumes every year, like one or two volumes would come out, where they would sort of discuss all kinds of things. I mean, they knew pretty much, they, they knew actually everything, sort of why people didn't buy, like sort of, my favorite one is um, an article on um, is not a stoic as valenak, sort of um, um, the durability of felt boots, or like how wide should be the um, um, uh, um, uh, mitas, um, how do you call it? Um, 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 Toilet, yeah. So the the quality of, of uh, porcelain, all that kind of stuff, right? And they they have all kinds of interesting sort of formulas and graphics and so on. So the the language was very very elaborate and and diverse, and they were precisely addressing the point that you said, like people are not buying things that we produce, and we need to learn what is it that they want, right? But there was a clear sort of disconnect because there was no way to influence the um, the producers, and that brings back sort of a major issue I didn't touch it upon, but it's interesting because the um, the factories were not free in producing their own things either, right? There was a gas plant that would come up that would use this nomenclature in order to tell the factories what to produce, right? And in that case, sort of in this case, they are, um, from Marx's point of view, so it was a usefully kind of invested labor, right? Once you start questioning this, 
it creates sort of a whole kind of economic, theoretically it creates a whole havoc when it turns out like it's not useful invested in labor. It's something else, right? So then what is it and who is to blame and who is to right? So you, they, they were trying kind of to get out of this interesting conundrum that they created themselves and entirely theoretically, right? And it's a random thing, they couldn't. I mean, so they just kept accumulating things. But then, sort of, again, lowering the prices wouldn't be the case, so it wouldn't be sort of an option. I have an example, I skipped it in this case, but about one of the journals, there is a long discussion on what was happening in Georgia. So, like, at some point, I think like seven, 1974 or something. So, they accumulated a lot of kind of shoes nobody wanted, right? They couldn't sell them in the country, uh, in, the, in the Republic, right? So, they can't uh, sort of decrease the prices because otherwise people might have. But them, right? No. So instead, what sort of they're doing, they started kind of pushing them outside the Republic. Uh, and that created an interesting sort of network of distribution. And for me, like, that's again, like, sort of, that's the point of the storage economy. So what it produces actually pushes people uh, towards integrative kind of um, uh, connections, network, and so on and so forth. Totally unintended. But that's how it practically was. And we know, like, sort of that being kind of organized, I mean, it sort of appeared again and again throughout the country. So it's this kind of sort of unintended consequences of these kind of theoretical exercises that I'm looking at. But your, your first question about the taste is, is, yeah, it's totally valid. Yeah, that's what precisely is happening. So people are watching this, and then Zvanetsky described it very well. People actually knew the categories. They might, might have never seen this turgeon, right? But they know that it existed, right? And if they had an opportunity to ask for it, they would. Right, even just sort of for the case, for the sake of it. And it's, it's again, it's a very interesting sort of development of, and I call it, like in one of my articles, imaginary consumption. So like people actually develop very complicated scenarios of imaginary consumption, vocabulary, like in the forms of uh, patterns of exchange, so on and so forth. Right, shut up. Um, thank, thank you. Uh, that was a very interesting talk. I'm really interested in your images. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, these right here, I feel like I'm looking at 17th century Dutch Press still lifes, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially the, the, the salami on the right with the chessboard in the middle of it. I mean, that's, that's exquisite. Mm -hmm. But could you go back to the refrigerators? Yeah. Because as I was watching this, I was trying to, I was trying to think about, um, so the galoshes, that's like an encyclopedic image. Mm -hmm. um, and in some of the salami, the grays seem like they're almost like the, how to engineer the perfect mm -hmm. sausage. But this looks like advertising to me. Yeah, it's for, for, for an entry on the холодильники, on the refrigerators. Yeah, but it, yeah. you could have just the picture of the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. It's so. I have no idea what the inside of a refrigerator in 1956 looked like. It's always full. Look like. <laughs> but, this didn't need to be an advertising image. So in other words, this is yeah. this is making me think of, you know, General Electric advertising it around mm -hmm. the same time. And I'm wondering, do you know anything about the actual production of these images? Who was producing the images? Mm -hmm. Where were they made? Yeah. Who was deciding what was going to be a color insert? I, yeah, I don't. It would be sort of a great product, uh, project. But I, I do know a little bit about the refrigerators. So uh, when Mikayan went to... Uh, uh, it was about 1936, I think it was, uh, sort of um, Stalin sent uh, Mikoyan to the U.S. kind of to travel here and to figure out how the Americans produced, I don't know, humble, like everything, pretty much. Uh, so he spent, I think, two months here, um, really got excited, so learned a lot, sort of went to, uh, um, like one example would be um, uh, Macy's in, in New York, and that's how sort of like you get the idea of Unider Magia throughout the Soviet Union. Um, and one example was refrigerators. Um, so he really kind of thought like that that would be sort of a good thing to do um, in the Soviet Union. <coughs> Apparently, um, that's sort of a story from his uh, memoirs. He told Stalin about that, kind of sort of like, yeah, we need to start producing the refrigerators. So, no, 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 really, no. <laughs> so that people don't need that kind of stuff. Like, sort of, they have other things to deal with this sort of um, thing. So the appearance of refrigerators, like in this case, after the, um, Stalin's death, is also sort of a, a reflection to uh, on that kind of sort of. Uh, um, kind of reluctance, uh, sort of, to use this particular commodity um, um, in, in the Soviet Union. But, um, but your general point, yeah, I, I, I need to look at, to look at it. I, I just don't know. I, I started kind of working on this. I'm still kind of just trying to decide, like, whether to do a separate project <coughs> on, on this uh, Slava, Tavar and Slava, because it's such an, yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, thanks. I really, I really like your discussion of how these creation of these stockpiles uh, create social relations and possibilities. And I'm thinking of all the sort of ways that then people reproduce their own stockpiles yeah. out away from that. And then I was wondering, what can you do with um, thinking contrastively about that idea in contrast to um, other kinds of piles? And I, and actually, uh, I'm thinking that I don't actually know enough about piles of trash during Soviet times and how much trash accumulated. But I'm thinking contrastively about about the the, the um, trash yards under capitalism and whether it, you know we're thinking about waste and where it accumulates. And and I can imagine people listening to this and thinking, well, what a wasteful system! All these piles in this in the in the squad, but 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 maybe that it's just piling up in different mm -hmm. places with different social effects. And so mm -hmm. um, what would be the connection between piles of trash and waste within the Soviet Union? And, and then are there ideological contrasts that people are making between the way we store excess mm -hmm. and then what, what is its fate in the Kapstrani? So there's a couple of questions yeah, no, in there. Yeah, yeah. the comparative, I, I, yeah. I, I need to think about it. I, I started looking, um, but then dropped. I started looking, and there's a TV series called um, Hoarders. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you watched it, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, like, when I was working on this uh, article, so I thought, like, well, okay, let's look at it. Uh, uh, but it's interesting here, so the, in this TV series, like, it's it's almost kind of, it's a, um, almost kind of medicalized, um, on sort of pathologized sort of uh, form of behavior. While, like, when my mother sort of produces, like, every fall, like, a, a, a huge amount of canned food that nobody eats, that seems to be normal, actually. That's, that's how you, you're supposed to, to, to waste your time and energy and, like, resources. And then, sort of, like, a year later, sort of everything has to be kind of taken to the garbage dump, actually. Right. So people kind of organize their sort of time differently. But, um, yeah, I... Yeah, I, I, I guess I, I need to think about sort of the ideological comparison. I, I didn't go in this direction for a variety of reasons, but yeah. But there was another question. Um, well, and then then I, I have the impression that in Soviet times, of course, there was ecological destruction and pollution and industrial waste. But my my impression is is that the consumer waste multiplies and that there was something about the relationship of consumption to waste that was really, that was really different. Yeah, I'm thinking and about sort of from the point of view of refuse, so like all this kind of waste, I mean sort of, yes, it, it's rotting in my um, storage cellar, but sort of it's still, an, it, the, the transition to the refuse stage is different from, from what is happening here. And I can need to think like when exactly it happens, at what point like sort of your rotten potato becomes actually rotten potato and so you have to throw it away. Uh, so yeah, it's it's problem, it's kind of more complicated, like the, it's choreographed, I guess, uh, like the choreography has more stages, like in the Soviet Union here, yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, thank you. It's um, really a very good and kind of concise presentation of theory. I'm wondering what happens in practice, and particularly there were other systems of distributions that were, of course, very important through the workplace. And those, the same buzzy, were not only part of the Ministry of Trade system, but they were also in close connection with the party and Soviet authorities. So, and it, it seems like this was a very interest, important instrument of power and control and distributing goods mm -hmm. depending on, on the kind of all these different political and economic reasons. So I'm wondering, I know it's, it's a kind of question probably doesn't have a clear answer because that was not part of the theory, mm -hmm. certainly. But to what extent this whole system was actually more politically motivated uh, than pr product of that kind of purely uh, speculative uh, mm -hmm. Uh, political socialism, and there was another, I think, aspect to that that was the strategic uh, reason. So, for the, the case of war, we had to have all those goods stored uh, for a certain number of days so that we can survive. And of course, the canned good, you know, this Toshonka that was released at some point after 30 years of storage, mm -hmm. all this kind of thing. So, I'm wondering if you kind of try to expand this into into political and um, social area. Yeah, I, I, I didn't go in this direction, and, and it's a very interesting kind of, um, um, area of this um, uh, topic, um, the emergence of those spitzkontingentes, or special contingents of people who were actually entitled uh, to certain uh, uh, forms of commodity uh, um, exchange. Um, and um, 
uh, I, I have um, in larger project, um, I have various lists of what was sort of um, officially allowed for these people to have, and it's kind of interesting, sort of like. Uh, because again, like it's not. I mean, what they could have done was kind of to tell them, well, like you're entitled to have, I don't know, 500 rubles or whatever, like 100 rubles. Where instead, sort of, no, it's very kind of deliberate. So sort of, you could have like sort of one can of or two cans of sprouts, uh, like um, 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 sprouts, right? To show kind of like stewed meat, like sort of a half a kilo of um, uh, hard candy, and sort of, and, and, and herring must be there, like all these kind of th uh, things, and you see how they're trying to use it to dif differentiate different groups, right? And you know, and, like chicken of a first category as opposed to chicken of second category of fatness, uh, and the, for me, the, yes, this is precisely sort of the mechanism through which sort of um, um, the administration of people and administration of things kind of nicely merges. It's, it's exactly what, what Engels wanted, like in a sense, right? So by administering things, like sort of you get, you structure sort of the mass of people. Um, but what is interesting, of course, is that sort of they were all relying on the same Tavarne Bazi, basically, sort of like especially in the province. So you know, you don't have separate um, things, right? And, but what, what it does then, as a result of that, it places the heads of these um, um, Bazas, right, in a very interesting sort of cultural political and material position. And um, um, I, I, I have a few cases of archival materials, like there are all kinds of sort of criminal cases associated with this, because they would sort of sell things, but uh, they weren't supposed to, so the question was how to hide uh, the money that they got, or how to appropriate the money that they got. And so there, there are interesting elaborate uh, kind of um, uh, dances that they created, for instance, sort of what they do then, they, they, they come up with this uh, interesting uh, name, Bestavarne Manufaktura, which means um, a, a non-commodified uh, um, um, manufaktura is a sort of a list of, um, kind of nomenclature, basically, a list of uh, things. So they would ask a particular store to fill out this form, uh, and so they would deposit money there, but sort of the product would never go through the store, right? So they created again, but it's the same point that I've been trying to make. They create all these alternative forms of circulation and exchange, but uh, they were possible only because they created a, si a system of storage, right? Without this, like, sort of, because all you need is a direct sort of link between the consumer and the producer, and that's it, right? But because they invest, invested so much money and effort in building this, they just couldn't sort of um, um, kind of walk away from that. And that was, again, also interesting. They knew precisely that, uh, I mean, the, the salespeople, they knew precisely that sort of the system is not working. So if you read Sovietske Targovli at the time, like in the 70s, they said, well, look, like sort of, in, even in, in socialist uh, countries of Eastern Europe, they are all moving towards this direct sort of supply and, and, um, and, um, and, um, and selling system. Right. And yet, sir, there is a massive plan of increasing those storage centers that basically would just hoard the, the commodities, right? So, I mean, again, like it was a long-term uh, decision that they made, and sort of they invested all this sort of resources, yeah. So uh, that, um, um, and uh, yeah, the war, um, yeah, it, it's interesting, sir, there is this term in Russia, Zakrama Rodin, and that's basically what I'm describing in this sense, like sort of how can, Zakrama, I don't even know how to translate it, sort of like the, the, this, the, the treasures, I guess, but it has something else. It's sort of hidden treasures of the motherland. Uh, and um, the, it started growing in, in 19, 1940, really, kind of sort of like the, the first kind of major uh, uh, attempt to problematize sort of this whole idea. Yes, we need to create the storage sort of capacities, right? But it never, kind of, it never, never really kicked in full kind of uh, in its full capacity until uh, Stalin's death. And again, it's interesting to see uh, uh, that we tend to think like that it, it was during the Stalin period uh, where centralization was really major, but actually it's not. Like it, if you look at the sort of that this particular area, it was pretty fragmented and, uh, and decentralized. It's with Khrushchev when it started, sort of like this idea of ministers that would accumulate and be responsible. And partly, I guess, sort of the idea was kind of if we are going to invest a lot of money, we need to know like how the gov from the government how to distribute this in a more on a more rational rational base. And then, I mean the. the the, the importance of this scientific approach that they keep kind of talking about is staggering, really. So like they keep looking for this kind of secret scientific formula that would allow them sort of suddenly organize and systematize all this kind of commodity mess. Yeah. Please. Mm -hmm. I think um, Je Deborah had a question <coughs> first, and then we'll come back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it was. Our question a bit. Um, you mentioned a little bit about the hoarding of money, and I 
I'm interested in the issuing of commemorative coins mm. or things that might be the, the parameters of the Tobarni Slavar. Um, I suppose basically my, my, my interest in this comes a little bit from cleaning out my own grandparents' house and finding that they had issued, they were the sorts of people who collected every single, you know, uh, for people here who know this, like Franklin Mint and all of your proof mm -hmm. sets and every sort of commemorative coin possible. Um, and out of curiosity, since I work in the region, I went and looked up and thought, oh, I wonder if the Soviet Union did this. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they did as well. And so I guess my question would be, since this is merely coming from, from curiosity about circulation of commemorative coins, does that begin around the same time period with concerns about hoarding of money or finding? And, and if that's not something that you've thought about, that's fine. I'm just interested in things that are kind of tabari, but not really. I, I didn't, but it, it's, it's an interesting aspect because they did start producing um, 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 kind of commemorative mm -hmm. coins in the 60s. It was uh, the revolution, uh, the 50th anniversary of the revolution. Um, so there was a Poltinik, uh, 50 kopecks. Um, and it's interesting, they were made out of silver, actually. And so like they were kind of hoarded for that reason. And then uh, it was big with the Lenin um, anniversary of 1970. Um, so there was a um, uh, ruble. Uh, ruble. With Lenin, and then with the Olympic Games, it became just all over the place. Oh yeah, um, I, I don't remember Gagarin. Gagarin probably not. I don't remember. But the Olympics, um, they decided to kind of to go like in full blast with this, and they produced a whole kind of um, um, line of different form, different. And and I was collecting them okay, personally. So you're <laughs> No, 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 no. I, I, I was collecting, so my mother did something to them, so <laughs> I, I, can't, if I can't forgive her for that. <laughs> yeah, I had sort of a huge jar of this rubles. Yeah, probably, yeah, yeah. Thank you for the talk. So I definitely fell into the trap of the white office clerk, so I'm just going, well, what? What's the limit here? You know, what can I get? So that I guess that's my question is obviously it's a giant selection, but what types of limits were there in terms of what they defined as a commodity? You know, like if obviously perhaps they wouldn't have a house in there, but would they have building materials or would they have cars or trucks or bicycles or you mean in, in those Yeah, in the, in the in the actual dictionaries. Oh, dictionary, yeah. yeah. Dictionary had everything. Everything. Yeah, like seri seriously, everything. Well, I, no, I, I was I... flipping it through yesterday uh, before, uh, no, not yesterday, the day before, yesterday. Uh, I, I have it at home, now I have my own copy of it. <laughs> so, yeah. so, and I was flipping through it, uh, like discovering, because I, I, I mean, I, I, I can confess I didn't read all five or uh, nine volumes, but sorry, I went through one. And um, for instance, when the, this time, the, the thing that really impressed me was, um, um, Boots for uh, uh, mountain skiing, and they have like a similar sort of colored page with I don't know like twenty five kinds of I, I didn't even know that they existed, really like in, 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 and and more importantly like in the late fifties, right? And there is a figure of a ski skier kind of going downhill and that kind of stuff, and like all this uh, chocolate covered candies, uh, even TVs, and there was even a colored TV, colored TV. So uh, in other words, like again, like sort of, it's 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 almost kind of science fiction of sorts, right? Like you have everything that you could think of, and then plus. Yeah, no, because I'm well, yeah. I would assume you wouldn't have weapons in there, right? You, I you wouldn't no have. Weapons, yeah. yeah. But those were not for sale. Yeah, but you would maybe oh, an no, axe for trees. They might, they might have had like sort of uh, uh, rifles, namely sort of like um, uh, a hunting chip, sort of hunting weapons. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. That was my question. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Thank you for a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic talk. Uh, I have a question. I, I just wanted to point out one of the things that's so great about this work is the way you're actually reframing the whole aspect of production and consumption, not in the consumption model that we think of in, a, in the capitalist West, but as part of a much larger uh, world um, in which consumer goods are only a small part, and the state is actually supplying lots of things that, that exactly as in, uh, as Alex was saying, are not commodities that here would be com somehow commodified. So that's one, I don't know, There's. I, I have so many questions I want to ask you. The other thing I'm really interested in is the way you're reframing and rethinking the use value, exchange value um, uh, dichotomy that, that comes up so often in anthropology. And um, so I'm having a hard time framing this question, <laughs> but thinking about uh, 
thinking about how use value becomes the m important thing and how exchange yeah. value is really yeah. uh, an exchange value and, and, and the problematic uh, position of money as really, except for commemorative coins, very much exchange value. And this, I was really taken with this um, phrase you said where, where trade did not mediate exchange but um, interfered with it in the West mm -hmm. and that the ideal here was that trade would um, just harmonize exchange. So in, in other words, the relationships between people um, would be mediated by things but without money and, and the way that's and like Phoenix. smoothed yeah. off in the, yeah. literally in the lack of or ornamentation of the yeah. objects. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you to say more about that and, and also about modernist ideology and modernist aesthetics as yeah. part of this. Yeah, no, we, we sort of had this discussion, but that's precisely sort of kind of my link that uh, with the um, Russian avant-garde of the 1920s, and I, I'm trying, like, it's a larger point um, in my recent work that I'm trying to make, uh, namely, we have a reemergence of the aesthetics and kind of an ideology of Russian avant-garde in the 1950s and 1960s after the war, after Stalin's death, and uh, you have the reemergence of ideas by people like Arvatov uh, with functionalism, but kind of functional is not in the, in the, in, in the sense that uh, kind of let's just simplify it to the core so because it would be a utilitarian thing. But the idea was, uh, with, and that's why I, I think uh, Russian avant-garde is so interesting because the idea is how can we explore and unpack the internal kind of uh, structure of a thing, right, without compromising its qualities, right? So by itself, it sort of, it has everything already. It doesn't need like all this, you know, uh, sort of argumentation, right? And so, and we see that, but we also see that it, why it didn't work, right, for a variety of reasons that has very little to do actually with the initial idea, right? But sort of this kind of the second coming of, of, of um, uh, modernism, yeah, I think, I think it's there, but it's sort of an, I, I want to work on this. Uh, and, then, and then again, like it's connected with use value and so, you know, the bracketing of um, um, exchange value almost entirely. But then of course, like sort of it's interesting also to think about the status of value as such, like and then sort of, and for me, an interesting question in all this kind of project was, how did they come up with prices, actually? If, like, we know that, like, prices reflect nothing, like, really nothing. But then you still need to have, like, at least, like, some idea. Like, I mean, if you're a bureaucrat who is responsible for, I don't know, kind of assigning a price to, like, a bottle of vodka, so how much do you? So, and I started looking at the documents, and it's like, sort of the, the, um, cost of the material and value of a labor was not really the concern that much. And they, they, they never actually knew. In, in fact, they, they would often engineer in it, do reverse engineering kind of in this respect. But they did pay attention to uh, how things um, uh, cost in the US, uh, for instance, in the West, and did some sort of comparative analysis sort of in trying kind of to figure out, well, um, sort of here in, in, in Russia, in the Soviet Union, certainly it costs more than there. Eggs, for instance, like we talked yesterday about that, eggs were very expensive in the Soviet Union, but other things are cheaper and therefore sort of kind of like, yeah. So it's, it, it, you see that sort of the rationality of it was, uh, was going <laughs> up to a point. After that, like sort of, yeah, you get into the comparative analysis and then it's all kind of sort of like social uh, distributive system and like sort of there are so many kind of things involved and they could play and then de depending on whom you're talking, sort of you get moments when one aspect would be emphasized at the expense of the other. Right? Yeah, no, but I agree in general. So yeah, I think we need kind of to push Kind of the, the consumption studies in the, in the social spirit elsewhere, right? So like this kind of constant sort of negative portrayal of it. It's not that it was it was a lot of fun, but sort of it, there were a lot of things happening that we could actually describe now. And we have access and we have the materials to do that. Okay, um, thank you very much yeah, for coming thank and thank you to Sergey for the wonderful talk.